It's interesting how you can actually see whether people are smiling or not, even above the masks. But uh, there's nothing like a flash of the old pearly whites there. During the course of the week, Carol posted a, um, a little meme on, on social media. Uh, a mother asking her little girl, why must we be quiet in church? And the little girl replied, so we don't wake anybody up. <laughs> Well, fortunately, I don't think we have that problem. Well, not too often, although we do keep an eye up here. I can watch everyone and <laughs> raise my voice if necessary. During the course of a discussion last week, actually, over tea um, after the service, uh, chatting with a couple of gentlemen who will remain nameless, and the subject came up of happiness and joy. And it was quite rightly pointed out that there is quite a considerable distant difference between the two. What is happiness and what is joy? So I did some research on this, and I discovered that the word happy or happiness appears in the Bible 27 times. A bit of statistical information for you. However, the word joy and joyful appears, would anyone like to take a guess? Not quite, 10% of that, 230 times. So the question is, are we happy or are we joyful? Well, if we are happy, we do what? That's right, if you're happy and you know it, <laughs> clap your hands. Well, we're all happy. But joy is slightly different. There is a difference between joy and happiness. And looking at the philosophical explanations, the difference between joy and happiness lives in the heart and the mind of people. It's said that joy is in the heart, but Happiness is in the face. Sounds very Asian, doesn't it? Confucius. But it's not. Joy is of the soul. Happiness is of the moment. Joy transcends. Happiness reacts. Joy embraces peace. Don't worry. Rejoice. Whereas happiness is a salve. It's a sort of balm. It's superficial. Don't worry. Be happy. Remember that song from the, was it the 70s? Joy is an inner feeling, and happiness is an outward expression. Joy endures. Happiness is fleeting. It's a bit like the buzz one gets if you happen to win the lotto or something like that. It's very fleeting. It's joyful and happiness for a win it, and then it doesn't go anywhere. Happiness does not bring joy, and joy isn't a byproduct of happiness. Joy is something grander than happiness. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit, and when we find joy, it's infused with comfort and wrapped in peace. It's all very poetic, isn't it? That's straight out of the books. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So against such things there is no law. And it's possible to experience joy all the time, even in difficult times. It's possible to experience joy even in times of grief. And my goodness me, over the past few years we've been here, there have been quite a considerable number of occasions where grief has risen its head. People may remember having read uh, Corrie Ten Bloom, um, who went through all sorts of deprivations during the war years. But the joy that she felt in being able to serve the Lord even under the most difficult and depraving conditions was a good example to all of us. Joy is what God wants for each one of us. It's an assurity. It's a certainty. Last week, not last week, sorry, the previous week when I last spoke, we spoke of frogs. I know some of you weren't here and they were wondering, what is he doing talking about frogs? Being fully reliant on God. And I thought I'd take it one stage further this week about what we experience when we do put our total trust in God, the sheer joy that it brings into the hearts and minds of those who accept the Holy Spirit in their lives, that inexpressible joy, that irrepressible, insuppressible joy, the joyous joy described in 1 Peter 1, though you have not seen him, you love him, even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and a glorious joy, for you know you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Joy bursts out 
Anyone ever met a new Christian? Yeah, they're a pain, aren't they? <laughs> oh, take cover when you see them coming. I remember an old fellow in the church we used to go to. His name was John Bull, God rest his soul. He was so full of the power of the Holy Spirit that when people, new people used to come to church, we would actually head him off at the pass because we didn't want him to frighten people. He was so full of joy, so full of enthusiasm. His first question even to a stranger are, are you saved? And if you gave the wrong answer, you were there for an hour and a half. He was full of the joy of salvation. But so many things get in the way of that joy. Dissent, conflict, factions. And at this point, I do have to admit that this message today is totally revamped from what it was two days ago. Because I can hardly speak of joy and happiness while the dark shadows of war hang, out, hang out around in the Ukraine. However, despite these dark times of war, in so many ways, it's a good example of how we can serve the Lord, and it's a stark reminder in the world today of what gets in the way of our day-to-day -day lives, where we're at. In so many ways, it's a wake-up call, not just for the West, but also for the church. There's a pervasive mindset in the world today that we as human beings can fix anything. There is nothing so serious that we as human beings can't fix. From pandemics to, to the weather. If we pay enough tax, the government will sort the weather out for us. Unfortunately, the biblical truth is that mankind is inclined to evil. And only the grace of God in Christ can bring peace. And I suppose nothing over the years has really changed. If we go back through the letters of Paul, we find he spends a great deal of time in all his letters reconciling groups and churches one with another to bring unity and the unity in Christ to bring peace. And in this scriptural reference we had today from Romans chapter 15, we see the same thing. We see Paul reconciling two groups of people towards each other, saying that there is peace in the unity with each other. Verse 5, we see, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity amongst yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one other, and then one another, and then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God, for I tell you that Christ has become a servant to the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you amongst the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. He's reconciling the two parties, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. But if they come together in unity, they will find peace together. And it's interesting that quote from Psalm 18, therefore I will praise you amongst the Gentiles. We note that that praise brings hymns to the lips of his faithful. It was Gloria Gaither, remember the Gaither group? Gloria Gaither, Mrs. Gaither, she's still alive actually. I was surprised, yeah. One of her quotes is, Praise is a, a result, not a reason. Praise is a result, not a reason. Quite often within churches, we go to praise the Lord, being the object of our attendance to give praise. But giving praise to the Lord is the result of our love for Him. In today's passage, Paul is encouraging the two factions and advising them that True joy can only be achieved through unity, one with another and with Jesus. And I think this is exemplified in the present conflict going on overseas. On the one hand, we have mankind's base desire, in a secular sense, to cause division and distrust between nations. And within the church, it's not dissimilar. Paul's circumstances in chapter 15, we notice that there is a division, there is a dividing factor 
within the church. We all know there's no such thing as a perfect church. We've had problems in many churches that I've been in. And this is no exception here where we have had a division, where we have had problems. But the true peace that we're finding at the moment is the result of the unity of coming together in our common love for Jesus Christ. Human nature is to try and sort it out themselves, but it is only through Jesus and unity that we'll find that peace. More seriously overseas, we see that there's a division in the church in the Ukraine. There's the one, there's the Orthodox Church, which is governed from Moscow. And then there's a new Orthodox Church, which is governed from the Ukraine. Politics getting involved within the churches. However, conflict or not, and even problems or not, as we've had problems here with COVID, we've had problems with fires, the church is always there in times of distress. The churches in the Ukraine at the moment are showing a wonderful example of their trust and faith. In fact, the letter, sorry, not the letter, the, um, the photograph that's in the bulletin today showing like-minded Christians gathering in the park to pray for peace. I've highlighted a word here in blue. If anyone plans on working at the front here, do not highlight it in blue because I can't see through it. Uh, very basically, how do we gain that joy? How do we gain that, that inner peace? And it's by doing. Doing what the scriptures allow us to do. Doing what the scriptures tell us to do. In addition to um, obeying the scriptures, the Lord exhorts us at all times to be joyful people, even in the most dire and difficult circumstances. In Romans chapter 12, verse 12 to 13, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. And in Thessalonians, be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. And in Philippians also, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's a good song, that. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. No, I'm not going to sing the whole thing. But what else brings joy? The simple answer is doing God's will. Obedience brings joy. In the scripture we had today and the scriptures above, which I've just read, in Romans and in Thessalonians, we're exhorted to be joyful in the Lord. But apart from just being joyful, we need to pray. And we're coming to a time of prayer where the 40 days of prayer are just coming up. We're exhorted to do that. It is a duty. It's our duty to pray. We believe in a God who answers prayer. Not only that, but we believe in a God who reigns over the world. And we need to bring all these situations to him. And when we pray, this brings the power of prayer into our hearts, into our lives, and also instills joy in the knowledge that someone sovereign is listening and is with us. Also, in these times of conflict overseas, we remember the quote from the canon J. Johns. J. Johns is a very gifted speaker overseas. We need to remember that the one sad prediction of warfare is that it is unpredictable, and the unpredictable is inevitable. We live in dangerous times, so we need to continue our prayers for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. It's also our duty to share. One of the few positive things about both the pandemic and the conflict is a reminder that the world is not a playground. It's a battleground. We're reminded of that in the scriptures, aren't we? We fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And we meet those people who are scared, and those people who are troubled, those people who have no future, those people who lead hopeless lives. And into this darkness, there's the opportunity to share the light of Christ, the hope of everlasting peace in the world, and to bring salvation. And of course, salvation itself also brings joy. The very assurance of salvation, regardless of our earthly consequences, brings joy. Even in war, the assurance of salvation defeats the fear and brings an innermost peace and joy. Jesus tells us, 
Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because we, the church, can bring that relief. We, the church, can give assurance to those people who live in fear, be it of disease, of isolation, of war, regardless of what that fear is focused on. In Isaiah, we see, to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution for you. He will come to save you. So we have every reason to rejoice in our salvation. And the joy of that salvation is not just for us ourselves, but also the salvation that it brings to others. We're reminded in the scriptures that the disciples were quite joyful when they heard that the churches in Phoenicia and Samaria had converted many Gentiles, and there was a great cause for joy. Strangely enough, preaching brings joy as well. Brings any number of feelings, I must admit. But preaching does bring joy, not just to those like yourselves who have the privilege of listening to myself. <laughs> no comment. But it does, because there are occasions when you do see the results of the word taking deep root in people's hearts. Persecution, strangely enough, also brings joy. The apostles in the early church rejoiced when they were persecuted. Peter reminds us, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. We know that there will never ever be peace on earth until we have unity in Jesus. That really is the sum total of the message. We know that. We've been told that from the beginning. But until we are as one with the God of peace, by very nature mankind is going to destroy itself. And we pray that he will come again soon. And then our joy will be complete. And at that time, you turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy. Wonderful words from Psalm 30. So despite the mayhem of war and the fear and the concern of COVID and the shutdowns and the isolation, the loneliness, our relationship with Jesus transcends all these things. And in Jesus, we have the assurance of joy. To repeat the scripture which I read just now from 1 Thessalonians. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And in conclusion, a reminder from our scripture this morning and a blessing for each one of us. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we do come before you with hopeful hearts, with anticipating hearts, with hearts yearning for your return so that your kingdom come, your will be done on this world as it is in heaven. We pray, Lord, for your return, but in the meantime, we pray for unity between ourselves, between countries, between people, between nations. We pray, Lord, against the powers of darkness that seek to destroy and we pray, Lord, for unity, which brings peace. In Jesus' name, amen.